But okay, I think it's time for Dr. Yes. Mark to get started. Hi. We've had a, a three-week hiatus, I guess, last week he was away and the week before of Shavuot. And just, of course, a reminder, um, we'll have this week and next week, and then please, God, Mark will be in Italy uh, with our uh, Tour in Motion uh, first travel group in three years, and then we'll be in Portugal. So we'll be taking at least, uh, I don't know, six, I don't know exactly how many weeks, six, seven weeks off, and then we'll please, God, resume uh, toward the end of the summer. So but we still have tonight and, to, and next week. So, Bakasha, Dr. Mark. Uh, yes, glad to be here. And uh, this is part 18, I believe. Happy to be here. And if you hear my voice, it's uh, because of uh, I do have COVID. I avoided it for oh. uh, for two years. But uh, what can I, I finally caught up to me? And uh, truthfully, it's a bracha. I got it now. Uh, and it's it hasn't been uh, that difficult. Uh, uh, I do. People ask me about my trip. So I'll spend a couple of minutes. I'll show you some pictures. And then I, I do want to respond to some questions and comments. But Rabbi Kelman said we're resuming our trips. Uh, which we are in two weeks, uh, God willing, two weeks from today, I'll be uh, already in Italy. But I want to tell you about something that really annoyed me, which relates to the trips. And uh, I guess if uh, I don't know what to say, a, a, a do-gooder or something, I'll tell you what annoys me. And I know some people will disagree with me, but uh, I'm going to show you what annoys me very much because I take you, when you come on the trips, I take you to great places. And I show you great things. In fact, those who will be with me in Italy, we're going to be entering the Venice ghetto in two weeks. And right as you enter the ghetto, right on the side, you have the actual declaration from the day the ghetto was established, uh, was it for almost, five, for almost 500 years ago, in which it states that the Jew, no one's allowed in here and the Jews are not allowed to leave and that they, they have to be here at night and non-Jews are not allowed to enter, whatever. I forget the exact law show. Um, when you come with me to Vienna, smack in the middle of the main square, right at the top there, you have a terrible anti-Semitic thing. And all throughout Europe, you see these things. And um, these are important, I think, to see, to show. Uh, people today don't read them. They don't pay attention to them. Who can read the Latin going into the Venice ghetto, what it says about the Jews? Uh, but when you lead a tour, this is what you want to see. And this is important stuff. And you have in Germany, on a number of churches, you have uh, many of the churches have, uh, not many, a few of the churches have this. Here, hold on a second. Let me um, find you something and show you something here. Um, because uh, the, uh, you might have heard of the, uh, uh, well, yeah, actually, oh, oh, actually, I closed you up. Hold on, I closed you off. Um, let me now share my screen again. Um, the uh, Ecclesia and Synagoga. So uh, this is the big one in Strasbourg, a famous one, uh, although now it's in a museum and it's replaced by replicas, but you have at various churches, you have examples of this. Uh, uh, so you have on the left, uh, the church standing triumphant and on the right, uh, the synagogue, you know, blindfolded because the Jews are blinded to the truth. And uh, she's, I guess, looks a little wanton, <laughs> usually it's described. And this is important. And I don't think anyone today going into a church uh, looks at that and is influenced uh, by this, but it's important. Now you have the Jew sow, that is, this is another common image of uh, the Jews suckling on a, a pig, because of course we don't eat pig. Um, and you had this in woodcuts. And here you have it in Wittenberg, which is Martin Luther's church. Uh, so uh, as a historian, this is the sort of thing which really brings to life what, you know, for hundreds of years, people walking into a church saw and how it turned them against the Jews. Now, of course, today in a place in Germany, no one's going to church uh, in all of Europe. Uh, they don't go to church anymore. But, um, and, and no one who's anti-Semitic is being anti-Semitic because of an image of, uh, which I don't even know what it means anymore. Uh, and it says at the top, shame on the full rush. I mean, but this is important historically. So then you have, I think call a kavod in my opinion to the top German court, because you have, a, a in the era of cancel culture, you have a, um, uh, where is it? The description of, um, you have this uh, Jewish individual 
who has been suing for years, I think it's described here, the plaintiff since 2018 to have the sculpture removed, just like they removed Confederate statues to remove this sculpture because it's anti-Semitic and shouldn't be on. Now, now despite the fact that the Jewish community, as it says here, um, um, created a site of remembrance, incorporating the sculpture. I don't know what to say. What can I say? Uh, it, it annoys me to no end that some Jewish person wants to remove the historical evidence of the anti-Semitism of Martin Luther in his own church. Uh, and it, it, it's not only a violation against history, it's a violation against, so uh, we should know the history of anti-Semitism. And it, helped, it hurts my tours, because when I go to these places, I want to be able to point to it and uh, I don't want to, otherwise, who knows, they'll destroy it, they'll send it to a museum. It's like what they did with all the statues they shook in America. No one knows where they are, they put them away somewhere, and I don't like it. And it annoys me, it's a do-gooder, and I don't like these do-gooders, because, uh, and no one's going to the church anyway, believe me, <laughs> they don't go to churches anymore. So what can I say? It, 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 if they ever took them down, I'd be very, very annoyed. Uh, but in terms of tours, since a number of you uh, asked, uh, let me just briefly uh, share something with you. Uh, and I do want to make a correction. Um, you know, I spoke a lot about Jerba. I took my son. It was a nice trip. Um, and I'm just going to show you a couple pictures here. Uh, you might recall when um, I've told you a number of times how the women don't go. I spent Shabbos again there. The women don't go to shul. And that's true. I did not see any women in any of the shows on Shabbos. I asked people, they say no women go to shows on Shabbos. But I also told you that one of the rabbis I said, who said, uh, what do women have to do with shul? He said, told me that uh, almost none will show up on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur either. But I was told differently. I was told this time that uh, most do go to shul. So one, someone even said 90% he thinks go to shul on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Obviously not this rabbi shul. And uh, a number of them go to hear shofar. And, uh, but that's the only time also that in Purim. Um, in fact, I... Um, let me show you something. I even was in one of the new shuls, well, not new show, a newer show, but they even built an Ezra Snashim. Here it is, about 15 years ago, he showed me. So uh, you see that uh, even in Jerba, there's uh, been some uh, changes going on. Uh, but just briefly, here's some, some of the pictures I've shown that I think you might find interesting. Uh, the children, you got to be there on Shabbos to see uh, hundreds of children. Uh, but I was interested also in the yeshivas, because there's a couple of yeshivas. So uh, here's a picture in one of the yeshivas. Um, look at all these young kids. Uh, by the way, they don't wear tzitzis, most of them. As I told you, they don't. And I asked the, one of the rabbin when I was there. He said it's very hot, so I get it. But uh, there's no expectation that uh, to wear tzitzis. But here's some other pictures I took. Um, Here you see a little kid, he does have tzitzis there, but others wouldn't. Uh, in the yeshiva here, uh, it's only Kodesh, no limude chol. There is another school where they can go and they can get some, um, they learn math and some science uh, for like an hour a day, but uh, some kids don't go. They just learn all Torah every day, except for, I think, Yom Kippur and I guess Tisha B'Av, but they're there on Shabbos. I went on Shabbos. They go to, after Shul, they go back to yeshiva every single day. 12 months a year, no, uh, no chofesh like we're used to. Uh, um, I'll show you some other things that I took. Um, here's another picture. That gown is because the guy is wearing uh, shorts, shorts. They, you can't wear shorts in yeshiva or when you're davening. Here's an, they um, took a picture of the Rebbe. Not, they don't feel they need to dress like our Rebbe's. That's the Rebbe. But these are guys are all uh, learning. Um, let me show you uh, one or two more pictures here. Uh, oh, so, uh, oh, here's another one. Um, just so the, they, they, they don't divide it by grades. They divide it by lear levels of learning. And interestingly enough, they publicize, I don't know if I told you this ever, they publicize uh, once or twice a year all the grades of all the students. I have a pamphlet I have, which has all the grades for each class. That will never happen in America because it's a violation of privacy. But there, you know, they feel that if, uh, you know, you, you got a 60 or something in, uh, in Gemara or in Halakha, that's going to embarrass you and you'll do better. So I asked, well, how could you do this? So they said, we're all family. So uh, it's okay. Uh, 
So here's another Rebbe. And um, um, I even have, I think, a video of, um, they, they review the Parsha. Here it is each week in uh, with the truck. Yeah, I took a picture of that uh, video. Let's see. So by the time uh, they're older, uh, they uh, they all they know the whole Torah by heart with the trap. Um, when you go into the shul, you have to wear a gown if you don't have um, uh, uh, if you have shorts. So, for example, this is my son uh, putting on his tefillin in one of the shuls. You have to wear this gown, which is strange. And um, there's 14 shuls in Jerba, including one in the shuk. So everyone can go for mincha when uh, all the worker, all the people who have their shops there. And uh, the final thing I want to show you is just so you think it was all uh, scholarship. And oh, yeah. this is in a place called Zarzis. I also had short son, which is near Libya. So much so that my phone was being charged a lot of money. It wasn't on the Verizon plan because it was going through Libya, believe it or not. And uh, But they have a whole community there, all Arabic speaking, the only place in the world where you get Arabic speaking children uh, who are Jewish. And uh, and so you don't think it was all, uh, all research and... Um, uh, going out there, uh, there's still, there's uh, lots of fun. If we ever have a trip there, uh, here I am in the Sahara. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so that's uh, our brethren in uh, Tunisia, in Jerba. Oh, it, it's very challenging, by the way, for Zionists, for, <laughs> because uh, they don't, they, they, although they're very big Zionists, they, uh, they don't do Tachnun, they do Hala without a Bracha and Yom Atzmut. They don't do Tachnun, the only place in the world, the day before Yom Atzmut, Yom Atzmut, and the day after Yom Atzmut, three days. Yet they do not want any of their children going to Israel. Because when after the state was declared and many of them went, uh, they became uh, Mesorati or irreligious. And everyone in Jerba, all 1200, are all Shomer Shabbos, all the children, because the only culture is the Jewish culture and the Arab culture, and then no one's going to be an Arab. But if you go to Israel, half these people, you see the typical Sephardic uh, groups, they would just merge in with, uh, you know, Masorati Sephardim, but not uh, really halachic. So, uh, and I, who can argue with them? It's, uh, it would happen. So they want all their kids to remain there and the community's growing. It's the only Jewish community in the Arab world that's growing. And uh, it's, like I said, it's something to behold. Okay, end of uh, that. Uh, let me go five more minutes. I have other things I want to get to, but I'll get to next week. Um, I, um, I got to show you another thing. This is unbelievable. Uh, because what I'm going to show you, I, I, I remembered it after the class. And I remember it was the big news because the, the, the professor who it concerned it was a well-known um, Christian Bible professor. Do you remember we spoke about Rabbi Dunner of Amsterdam he had his commentary on the Talmud where he has this uh, unusual idea that certain passages of the Talmud were really uh, meant to mock the rabbis and then they got incorporated. And one of the ones, he, the example was, is uh, the case where a guy falls off the roof and hits a woman on the way down, they have sex, whatever. Now, uh, I, I think this is, I, 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 I don't talk to me think, the average standard view, and this of course is the correct view, is that the Talmud will sometimes give crazy cases. Not that it ever could happen, but they, they want to give the most extreme case. Uh, uh, and when, and when we were in Gemara when I was young, we'd ask questions and they're about the cases, and the Rav would say, you know, kasha from Misa. You don't ask a kasha from Misa. And uh, the Gemara sometimes will give these extreme cases, and sometimes they give the extreme case because then it covers anything, anything imaginable. But there was this uh, professor who um, he. Um, Apparently, for years, he would um, <laughs> he would give this uh, case, this story, and he would use it to contrast. At least he claims to contrast with Christianity. That in Christianity, if you have the intention, but you don't do it, you still get credit. In Judaism, if you don't have the intention, it can still have significance. I forget the exact details. I actually think he probably was using it as an example to show the foolishness of Jewish law that it deals with all these extreme cases. But if you can believe it, um, 
this is going back already to the 90s. It's not just something happening today. You think we only have snowflakes today. Uh, no, this woman at this very progressive, which they would call woke uh, Christian seminary, protested that telling the story of the Talmud made her feel unsafe or uh, abused or whatever it was, some nonsensical thing. And the professor was, um, he was uh, disciplined. And he was, um, she charged that, his, that by using the story, his, the lecture unreasonably interfered with academic performance. He was put on probation. He had to apologize, was told to get therapy and never to be alone with a female student, even though he had taught this passage for many years. Now, what's interesting is in all the articles about this, in one of the articles, they, they, they got to Ravaro and Soloveitchik. Uh, uh, he says, uh, Ravaro says, the professor made an innocent statement and he quoted the Talmud correctly, says Ravaro and Soloveitchik, a noted Talmudist and Dean of Brisk Rabbinical College in Chicago, people should stop reading their own prejudicial ideas into the Talmud. It's libelous against the Talmud. But uh, I mean, this is interesting, sexual or textual harassment. And then you have another one, unintended sex leads to unintended fall. Uh, professor files suit over charge of harassment. I just, I just Googled it and these were the three that came up because I remember it was a big case, but there's many, many others. Uh, really, really crazy. <clears throat> Let me go two more minutes. Um, in terms of Brich Shemay, I thank the person who commented on the video on YouTube and also uh, Avi Katz for reaching out to Rabbi Jaffe, the uh, head of Maimonides now, that uh, they do not, in the day, from already in the days of the Rav, they do not say Brich Shemay. And anyone who wants more details on it, uh, you can find it in, um, hold on, in this book by Rabbi uh, Binyamin Hamburger, uh, Minhag, Shoshi Minhag Ashkenaz, the first volume, he has a whole discussion of Brich Shemay, how originally this was not Ashkenazic Minhag. And um, you can read all about it. I have other things I want to get to, but I'll do this next class, including the Rambam. And I, I was right in my memory and not teaching a child umnus a profession, why he doesn't record it. I was also in Paris on the way back. Uh, I will share some halachic interesting things that... Uh, I saw in Paris that I think you'll find interesting because we take for granted just the opposite because we don't live in a place where it doesn't get sun, sun doesn't set till almost 10 o'clock at night. Uh, many people, because we live, in, maybe at the end of the class, I'll get to it. They assume certain things about Jewish life because they live in a time, in a time zone where things are uh, relatively easy. And um, I also want to get to, uh, oh, I want to refall Breuer and his commentary on Shira Shiri. We'll get to that as well. But it's already time, so I want to pick up now uh, uh, where we left off. Especially since I do want to wrap up to a certain extent, uh, if I can, by next class, because then I'm going to be off uh, uh, for a while, for a couple of months. Uh, but uh, let us begin. Um, if you recall, and if not, uh, I encourage you to go to the go to the videotape. And uh, as uh, Warner Wolf used to say, uh, Warner Wolf was uh, uh, together with my father in uh, school in Washington D.C. But um, if you remember him from the news, let's go, you can go to the YouTube or the uh, Torah in Motion, and you can listen to it. We were we were in the middle of dealing with Abraham Geiger and uh, his approach. So let me pick up just by saying that according to Geiger, uh, and he's clear about this, um, in the battle between Pharisees and Sadducees, everyone wants to be a Pharisee, the Orthodox, and that's what they're called now, the Orthodox are the modern Sadducees. Just like the Sadducees died out because they couldn't change with the times. When the temple is destroyed, they were so attached to the temple, they couldn't adapt and therefore they disappeared. Uh, so to the Orthodox or the traditionalists, uh, now that we're entering into a new era of emancipation and Jews are being welcomed um, into the modern state, uh, uh, the, the traditionalists can't live like this. So they can only live in a ghetto when they control people and don't allow them uh, to uh, live uh, the way they want to live. And therefore he had no doubt that the Orthodox would not be able to survive. Now you could say uh, that, well, Geiger has been proven wrong. Uh, orthodoxy has survived, and I have no doubt that if Geiger was alive today, he'd be quite surprised that, uh, that there's still a vibrant orthodoxy, orthodox community that pass it on to their children. And yet, in a sense, you could look at it the other way and ask, really, uh, 
has orthodoxy really survived in a significant sense? If you take the United States, and what are the Orthodox, we're told? 12, 13, 14% um, of the American Jewish population? That's not really very successful. Now, it's true that as every year goes by, the, uh, the Orthodox percentage grows, and both in terms of absolute numbers and in terms of percentage. But uh, much of that is due, uh, well, obviously, the Hasidim have a lot of children. But uh, uh, in terms of percentage, really, because the larger community is just disintegrating and disappearing. Uh, so uh, I don't know if in retrospect, uh, if a 15% um, survival rate of the Orthodox, which then will become the Jewish community to a large extent, in certain places it already is the majority, like in Baltimore, but um, and, you know maybe Geiger could say that's not such a success. But be that as it may, uh, a Geiger did not even think that you could have any vibrant uh, religious communities in modern times. And I mean, this uh, Hirsch agreed with Geiger on this major point, as we'll get to it, that uh, traditionalist Judaism of the sort that Geiger was referring to could not survive in modernity. Uh, that's going to be Hirsch's major point. And, Hirsch, and it became clear very quickly from 1800, where in a place like Germany, traditional Jews were the majority, to 1850, where they were the minority in all the big cities. Uh, it happened within two generations. Uh, that showed that, uh, according to Hirsch, that the uh, rabbinic leaders were had missed the boat and were not living in accord with Torah and Derech Eretz, which means that the Torah has to confront and uh, be a controlling factor in every civilization. If you're living in the 19th century Germany, like you're in 18th century Berlin, Warsaw or Vilna, then there's no way Judaism is going to survive. So we'll see that uh, a, a figure like Shumshin Raphael Hirsch is going to be the biggest adversary for a Geiger because he shows that contrary to what Geiger says, uh, that traditional Judaism can survive. But both Geiger and Hirsch agreed that the old form of traditional Judaism could not survive. Uh, Geiger drew one conclusion from it, that therefore we have to abandon traditionalism in its entirety. And Hirsch drew the other conclusion. And once Hirsch's method gets going, there's very little attrition. In fact, Geiger felt so threatened by Hirsch's approach that he wrote a review of uh, the 19 letters uh, in opposition. Uh, so what is the basis of Judaism there for, for Geiger? If it's not Jewish law, if you ask traditional Jews, of course, it's halacha. <clears throat> well, he believes that uh, Judaism has, I guess we can call it a creative spirit. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Uh, and uh, everything that's been part of Judaism, including halacha, arose from this creative spirit. The fact that halacha doesn't speak to us anymore doesn't change the fact that it arose from, the, arose from the creative spirit. But for Judaism to survive, every generation needs a new creative spirit. So the idea, remember, it's not reformed Judaism. That's like, uh, you know, happened in the past. No, it's reform. It continues, uh, it's reform. It continues to change. And uh, although even someone like Geiger and the early reformers could never imagine what reform Judaism became, they did recognize that moral values change. And um, therefore it doesn't make sense, for instance, when um, years ago uh, someone wrote an essay uh, against uh, the, the changing view of reform about the homosexuality and said, what would uh, Solomon Freehoff and uh, Claude Montefiore say if they were alive today? Because it's not important what they would have said if they, you know, if they, you know, it's not important what someone a uh, hundred years ago or 75 years ago would have say. It's important if he'd actually be living today, not if he'd get up from the grave, because uh, the attitude is that uh, morality changes, our understanding of morality changes. Uh, they progress. Now, how far do you progress? Okay, let's they let the reformers uh, duke that out. Uh, but Geiger puts a great deal of emphasis on this factor, the notion of the times, that religion has to listen to the outside world. It can't live in a vacuum. Judaism changes. It has to change. And that's where his scholarship is so important, because he's not just some preacher preaching about how it has to change, and we have to listen to the outside world, because the outside world is like a form of revelation. There's this dialectic here. It's not that we see how things are, people looking for freedom, things like that, and that speaks to us. And we look in our tradition and we see God's word in the past, that sort of stuff. It's not, it's not like you can open up the Torah and actually point to this verse or that verse, but it's a dialectic of what we hear. And remember, the Torah comes from the people itself. That's where it comes from for someone like Geiger. Uh, 
but Geiger is not just some preacher, like I said. Geiger is a scholar, a great scholar, and it's going to be his understanding of ancient Jewish history in particular, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, he's going to focus on them, that's going to enable him to legitimize reform from a traditional sense in his mind, that is to show that it's carrying on a tradition. It's not just a break with tradition, something new. He could have said that this is reform, this is the past. There were reformers who said this, that this is how we used to live, but now we understand we have to live differently, and therefore uh, it's a break, and now we're going to create a new type of um, religion for our people. No, Geiger sees, he wants to create a historical link. And he does this through his uh, scholarship to legitimize reform because now reform is authentic. And his views in this are seen most clearly in a book that he wrote, which uh, is a work of scholarship, but is more than a work of scholarship. Uh, you can get it, I see on Amazon, a reprint, even in paperback, the Erschrift and Übersetzungen der Bibel in ihrer Abhängigkeit von der inneren Entwicklung this Judentum, so um, the uh, the original source and the translations of the Bible and its connection to the uh, develop, in the development of uh, Judaism. So what is this book? Well, uh, it's a study of uh, the Targumim and of the Septuagint and uh, what we can learn about how Judaism developed based on this. Um, we all know that there's Targums. Targum um, is uh, the Aramaic translation of the Torah. You open up any Mikros Godolos, you have Unkos, but then you have other Targums. You have um, Targum uh, in, in, in Nach, in Navi, you have uh, Jonathan, Targum Jonathan, you have Ketuvim a Targum, they call it Jonathan, it's not. And on the Torah, you have a Targum, it, the scholars refer to it as Pseudo-Jonathan because it's called Targum Yonatan, but we know Yonatan didn't write it. In fact, the reason it's called Targum Yonatan is because originally it was tough apostrophe Yud. And uh, the, the printer thought that was Yonatan, but actually it refers to Yerushalmi, Targum Yerushalmi. And there's a fragmentary Yerushalmi with another, we have another full Yerushalmi, it's called Targum Neofiti, because that's what the name was given, was discovered at the Vatican. So we have a number of Targumim, uh, other than Unculus, the others are more expansive, uh, very midrashic. We have the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Torah. We have uh, the Vulgate, obviously, the Latin translation. We have, in terms of ancient versions, we have the Samaritan text. And we also have uh, a testimony of, of, of ancient texts in the, in the Talmud, in the Midrash, uh, uh, other, other sources. So there's a lot to work on in this regard. Uh, but what Geiger is going to tell us is that there's a whole history to Judaism that uh, in a certain measure we can see through these ancient texts. Uh, no one really had argued this uh, before uh, to the extent that uh, Geiger did. I mean, he, he's speaking in terms of grand theological ideas. It is true, as we'll see, that even before Geiger, uh, it had been argued that the scribes, the Sophrim, and even the Masoretes, we're going to see about the Masoretes, the ones who punctuated the Torah, had altered the original text. We'll talk about Tikkun Sofrim. But Geiger is going to go much further because he's going to offer a complete uh, discussion of this uh, phenomenon. And um, he's going to show us that he thinks that uh, there, have, there were evolving views, theological views, religious views. And we can see the, um, the remnants of them in the various versions of the Targumim, and uh, this affects theology, it also affects halakha. Uh, before Geiger, most people said, well, these are mistakes, these are errors, copyist errors or translation errors. Um, and, uh, but Geiger said, no, these are not errors. These are not mistakes. These are different halakhic positions, different ideological positions that we see in the uh, ancient texts. And uh, of course, the upshot of all this is going to be is going to be that Judaism is constantly evolving, constantly being changed because the rabbis are the ones, according to Geiger, who basically pushed out all these texts and these ideas for their own reasons, as we'll see. Um, in fact, he says that in these early texts, we see the struggle between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, and as well as all sorts of other political and religious uh, struggles. But with the destruction of the Beis Amikdash, then the Pharisees are in charge and they were able to set the, uh, the text of the Torah. They were able to remove all these other types of Judaism and uh, create one text. So, but the Septuagint reflects a completely different type of Judaism. It's not just, it's a mistake and all the other versions as well. 
And therefore, Onkelos, for instance, that's the Pharisaic Targum. But what about the Septuagint? Septuagint is the Greek translation. It's the Bible of the Greek Orthodox uh, Church. Um, well, the Old Testament of the Septuagint, um, Geiger says, has a different halacha, which means that it was working with a different text. And Geiger thinks that uh, what we have, our text, what we call the Masoretic text, was actually altered for ideological reasons to reflect the new halacha, namely the Pharisees created a new halacha. And of course, Geiger is a new Pharisee, so he can also create a new halacha. That's why this isn't just scholarship, but this is scholarship to make a point, to prove something. If you can show that the Pharisees were engaged in reforms, that is, they didn't like earlier halachot, and therefore they reformed them and came up with their own halachot, and then they altered, the they changed the text of the Torah to reflect their own halachot, well, then Geiger is part of historical continuum, and uh, he can do the same. Uh, in fact, he would say that the Septuagint preserves the ancient or the authentic reading. By the way, since um, I just thought of this as I was preparing today, the Supreme Court is going to uh, come down with its ruling. It could be released tomorrow or the next day. I mean, we sort of know what it's going to say. Well, I shouldn't say that because you never know, at least based on the leak, that Roe versus Way is going to be overturned. And this has led the last few weeks to... Uh, great disputes in the Orthodox world. I'm thinking of Torah motions in Canada, so maybe they don't feel the weight of this moment because I'm thinking maybe you should have a, a class or two or discussions on it. Because on the one hand, you have people like Rabbi J. David Bleich coming out uh, like an evangelical preacher saying that the Orthodox Jews should feel a debt of gratitude to the Catholic Church for fighting this battle that we have been on the sidelines on. And on the other hand, you have Rabbi Jeremy Weider, the complete other side, um, gave a very interesting interview on the Roy Scott Kahn. He was with Brandeis with me, his uh, podcast, The Orthodox Conundrum, in which Rabbi Jeremy Weeder very eloquently explains why it's in Jew, Orthodox, Orthodox Jews' interests, Dafka to be, to support Roe versus Wade and how uh, overturning this would be uh, a terrible thing. And, uh, and I guess you have everyone in the middle. In fact, I was shocked that uh, there's a, an audio from a few years ago of Herschel Schechter and what, I don't think there's anyone more liberal about abortion or first Schechter. He's talking about abortions in the ninth month uh, for good reasons. And I don't, that's the Tzitzeliezer says until the seventh month. And Rav Schechter is saying he doesn't understand it's uh, why you can't go to the ninth month if it's an important reason. And uh, he's talking about a case with a Beis Yaakov girl and with the Rabbanim in London, they got pregnant and I think it was a Beis Yaakov girl and they allowed her to have an abortion. But then he says into the ninth month, I, I, I know a lot about the issue. As far as I know, there's not never been a post sake unless it's a matter of life and death for the woman, but not for these other concerns to have an abortion in the ninth month. I was a little shocked to hear of Schechter say it. But uh, so I can tell you that in the Orthodox world, the views go from all the way on the right to all the way on the left um, and, and all arguing from Torah sources and what should be our position. So if I could put my two cents in, I think maybe Rabbi Kelman should... Uh, uh, maybe I, it's, not, it's not an issue in Canada, I think, but it's a big issue in America and uh, it's coming down soon. Well, uh, if I can, we have one of the most liberal abortion laws in the world. Yeah. I don't think there are no restrictions on abortion as far as I know in Canada. There was big debates. Uh, Henry Morgenthaler, those who know, was an Auschwitz survivor. Was the, he went to jail a few times because he was giving abortions, you know, when they were illegal in Canada. And now it's totally legalized. There's no law restricting it. And uh I'm with you. I'm uh, I'm very much in favor of Roe versus Wade. I, I'm with, with Jeremy Weider. It's good for the Orthodox community to have Roe versus Wade, but that's a whole other story. I remember, Roe versus Wade ended it at six months. It's not like in Canada where in the ninth month or something you can do I it. don't know that there's any prohibition in Canada. There's not. You can do it into the ninth month. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of Canadians are on the yeah. uh, on tonight, but I, I think there's the Supreme Court. There was a law and the Supreme Court threw it out years ago, and Parliament has never passed an abortion law as far as I know. And it's been made a lot of news here. It's been a lot in the newspapers. Everything, you know what they say, when a America sneezes, we catch a cold in Canada. So that's the expression. Now listen, when a, when a woman's nine months pregnant and she can give birth tomorrow when you permit an abortion. I, I didn't say for me, I'm just saying <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, I mean, okay, well, okay. Well, okay. Well, but, um, so why do I mention this? 
By the I way, that was, uh, that was when somebody asked before, we're going to do medical ethics. So that's one of the things we want to discuss next time we do medical yeah. ethics. Bro, we'll discuss it. Okay, I'll let you and, talk. Uh, so why, uh, why do I mention this? I mention this for one reason, because uh, just to show you the sort of thing that Geiger was speaking about, I think I'd give you an example. I'll give a few other examples. And then I was preparing the examples. I'm thinking, well, the abortion is a great example of what Geiger is speaking about in terms of a different halacha expressed in the Septuagint, where it isn't just an error or a mistake. His point is it's a different halacha, which has then been pushed out. And uh, so what's the example? Well, here's the example. And it's very uh, in Yona de Yoma. So in the book of uh, Shemos, uh, no, this is actually the wrong. Uh, chapter 21. Um, you know, the, 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 it's, it's always curious as to uh, the title of this book, Exodus in Hebrew, uh, because um, we have another book, uh, Numbers, Bamidbar. So a lot of people like to be technical and they say, uh, well, it's not Bamidbar, it's Bimidbar. But really it's Bamidbar because uh, you're, you're not, it's only Bimidbar if it's a construct. Uh, if it's not a construct, it's a one word, so it's Bamidbar. And I always made that point, and that point has been made in another. So you say we're reading Parshas Bamidbar. On the other hand, but then you have a problem, though, because Shemos, uh, the, the plural of shame is Shemot. It, it's only, uh, oh, no. only, it's only Shemot I when know. it... He comes from Borough Park. I know his family. But hold on, hold on. I got to... I know up. his family. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. I got a little sound. They, um, so the... Um, the construct is Shemot, but without it, there's a Seire under it. So uh, it's, uh, I don't know what it should be then. So maybe it's, if it's Bambi Bar, it should be not, sh it should be Shemot. And if it's Shemot, it should be Bemi Bar. Be, be that as it may, uh, chapter 21, verse 22, very famous verse. It's the classic verse on the abortion issue. The If men strive together and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart, that is, they cause her to miscarry, and yet no harm follow. The lo yason. So, what's the punishment? Uh, she'll be surely fined according to what the husband's woman's husband shall lay upon. Him. The husband will make a claim, and then the judges have to determine it. And then it goes on. If any harm follows, it's life for life, eye for eye, etc. So we know that the the rabbis don't interpret eye for eye literally, but uh, life for life is literal. Uh, eye for eye because they say who knows whose eyes better than the other. Uh, but this is important for the abortion issue because we see that um, if um, the woman is killed, we say I, and, and we say a life for life. But if her fetus is killed, we don't say life for life. It's, um, we treat it as property. Now it doesn't mean it's property. It's certainly more than property, but uh, how else, do you, that's the only thing you can do. If you knock out someone's eyes, well, I mean, your eye is obviously much more important than property, but uh, how else can we compensate you? So we see from here that it's not regarded as a human life um, before uh, birth. We don't know what it's regarded from this pasuk, but it doesn't have the same standard as a human life. And all Jewish discussions of abortion begin with this. And with the exception of Ramosha Feinstein, everyone assumes, therefore, by definition, it can't be murder because it's not a human life. Uh, Ramosha Feinstein's position is the most extreme I think ever offered on abortion, which is unusual because he's known generally as one of the mekilim in halacha and in these uh, weighty cases, but uh, very stringent on, um, in fact, on the, uh, on Rav David, Licht Rav David Lichtenstein's podcast on this issue where he had Rav David Cohen on who had uh, more of a middle of the road position. Um, Rav David Cohen really rejects Ramosha and says Ramosha is not is out of the mainstream and uh, on this. So I found that uh, interesting. Okay, so what what does this have to do then with um, the, the point? Well, if you look at um, the Septuagint, here's the verse uh, verse twenty two. If two men strive and smite a woman with child, and her child be born imperfectly formed, then he shall be forced to pay a penalty as the husband may lay upon him. He shall pay with evaluation. But if it be perfectly formed, he shall give life for a life. Wait a second, verse 23. Verse 23 is if any harm follows. We're talking about harms follows to the woman. And the previous verse says, if um, they uh, hurt a woman with child so that her fruit departs and no harm follows. That is no harm follows for the woman. And yet here it says, they interpret ason 
is not meaning no harm follows, a son is formed. So whether it's, if it hasn't been formed completely, then you pay the penalty. Today you might say viable, but if it's perfectly formed, which you might today say, if the baby's viable, then it's life for a life. Well, that's uh, this, uh, according to this understanding, the Septuagint, uh, a fetus is a human life. And um, it's, but it, it's only a human life, not a conception, like the Catholic Church says, which wasn't always the position of the Catholic Church. It wasn't St. Thomas Aquinas's position, by the way, but today is the position from conception. But uh, according to this reading in the Septuagint, at, uh, when the child is formed, and you can understand why people would say that, because when a child comes out, you could see it looks like a human, uh, so it's a human. So is this a mistake? Uh, well, uh, scholars, many scholars have argued this is a mistake. The Septuagint misunderstood it. No, Geiger would say, and I don't know if he actually deals with this uh, passage, but this is his whole point is in his book in dealing with uh, changes in halakha and Septuagint that no, this is not a mistake. This is a different tradition. This is a different understanding of the verse. That's what uh, Geiger's whole position is. And I'm gonna give you some other examples where Geiger does this. Um, actually, I'm gonna not deal with halakha, as much as I'm going to show you examples in theology, which I think you'll find interesting. Now, Geiger is correct about one thing. That is, the text of the Torah was in a, um, let's say, a more fluid state. Uh, there were different versions. Um, we, do, what do we say about the Masoretic text? I don't think anyone would say, can say, that uh, with absolute certainty, this is the authentic text. I mean, the, the Gemara, the, the, not the Gemara, the Hach Midrash and uh, the Sifra, and uh, I think it's in Devarim Rabbah, I believe, already speaks about how in the days of um, uh, Chazal, they had a dispute among the Pharisees. That is, they didn't know what certain verses meant and they, they went by the majority. So we know that there were uh, different versions and Alpi Halacha, that's all you can do. You take the majority, you go Alpi Rove and... Uh, that determines the halacha. So we're not bound dogmatically to deny the fact that there were other versions. Uh, we have very different versions in uh, medieval times even. Uh, and we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, but um, if you believe in halachic system, then you believe that, um, I'm not saying you believe that it uh, has to be the authentic text given to Moshe Rabbeinu, but you believe in the halachic system, just like we believe in halacha is decided a certain way. The whole story of the oven of Achnai, Tanar Shachnai, the halacha is being decided incorrectly, wrong. That is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's intention, as it were, is different. But no, lo he. So this is how we decide, and that's, uh, and you can look at my book, of Mitzvah Orthodox Theology, I quote all the Rishonim and Achronim who deal with this. And that's not controversial. That's not controversial at all. But what's, what's interesting in Geiger and is that he's, he's not arguing that the Septuagint reflects, let's say, a mistaken text or a different version that just arose, uh, idiosyncrasies of translators. No, he's saying that uh, these reflect a completely new, different halachic system or different theological system. That's, um, I, scholars today don't take this seriously. Uh, his point, I'm saying especially his point dealing with that uh, this often reflects Pharisaic, Sadducean rivalry. Uh, first of all, now we know that it's, it's really not between Pharisees and Sadducees, that that's not the whole story. Uh, we have the whole, we have the Dead Sea sect. We know that things are much more complicated. And there's, as far as I know, and uh, we have someone who listens often who's an expert in this area. So I'll let him weigh in because I'm hardly an expert on this. And he can tell me, he's emailed me many times. Uh, uh, tell me please, because I'm aware of no evidence that the, um, that the sectarians would manipulate the text of the Torah to uh, put forth their own uh, theologies. Uh, I mean, if there is examples of this, please let me know. But Geiger does argue that they, uh, the ancient translations not just change texts to agree with their halachic approach, but also in order to accord with the theology that uh, was prevalent at the time. And um, not just the, uh, the translations, but later the, the, the well, not, I, it's not like the punctuators, because this goes back already to the rabbis, that they changed the pronunciation of words because it was only vocalized with the actual vowels later in order to, to bring it into line with theological ideas. So let me give you an example of what Geiger says on this. 
and um, uh, you know, Shadal Shmuel Double Gatsato says something, basically says the same thing. So uh, they were both coming across the same, saying the same idea. Um, not really sure what to make of this. Uh, if you look in um, Shmos, uh, chapter 34, verse 23, we have a Pasuk we know well. Shalosh pamim bashana yera kozachorcha es paneha adon Hashem al Yisrael. Three times in the year shall all thy males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. What Geiger says, and again, he wasn't the first to do so, Shadal, Shmuel Dovel Itzato, the Shmuel Dovel is a big, is a traditionalist. He's one who attacks Geiger, but he's a traditionalist with um, some unusual ideas. On the one hand, uh, he's, uh, I mean, he's also a big defender, Shadal, the greatest defender of the unified Isaiah. But he was not afraid to put forth, uh, I guess, uh, provocative ideas. Both of them say as follows. And Geiger, you know, Shadal just has it as a throwaway. Geiger has this as a major point. What Geiger says is as follows. That originally, this Pasuk must have read, Shalosh pa'amim b'shana yire kol zechorcha as p'nei ha'adon ha'shem al Yisrael. Geiger says that it doesn't make sense to read it grammatically, yire kol zechorcha. And uh, he gave another example. And he, he quotes, he quotes the... Um, the uh, hold on a second. I, look at the very next verse, verse twenty-four. Um, Ki yorishka imi panecha marish et arzacha ba'alosha leira osas panei Hashem al kecha shlosh panim b'shana. The translation of this is uh, when you go up to appear before the Lord thy God three times in the year. Geiger says it has to be originally have read ba'alosha liros. And he gave uh, one other example of this, uh, or more than one, but this is the one I recall. If you look in um, Shmuel Aleph, uh, Perak Aleph, verse uh, 22, it says, V'chana lo'asa, chana did not go up, ki amra isha, for she said to her husband, adi gamel hanar, until the child be weaned, v'hali osiv, and uh, when I will bring him, v'nir a, Es pnei Hashem, the Ashav Sham Adolam. Now, this that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. So Geiger says it clearly did not originally say Venir A et Pnei Hashem. He says that's not grammatical. Nira here is used in the Nephal. Passive. He said it had to have originally said, Vaviosi, that will bring him Venir E es Pnei Hashem, and uh, we will see. God. Now, this doesn't mean, Geiger holds, that the ancients thought that uh, you could see God. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that they were more comfortable expressing themselves in this way, that we're going to go up to the temple and we will see God. What it means is that we'll see the glory of God in uh, the sacrifices in the temple. But Geiger says when you get by the, at some time during the second temple period, the, the Chachamim saw this as blasphemous, to read it as we will see God, because of course you can't see God, and therefore they changed it to um, to Yerah, to, uh, you know, will appear, will come up. Uh, that's, that's what Geiger says. He actually, he brings another example, which I think is really doubtful. Um, here in uh, Vayikra 9.4, he says, uh, Actually, we'll, we'll skip. I we'll, we'll skip that. I don't need to get to that uh, for now. Uh, so that's an example that Geiger says that the the sages they they had a reading tradition. They thought the reading tradition was blasphemous, so they changed the reading tradition. Now, I guess you could argue that this is um, this is not even problematic from an orthodox standpoint because you could say that the the the, the, the sages were re returning to what it should be, where you could say that it was uh, that, well, actually, I, maybe, I don't know if you, I was going to say that the sages were um, correcting a mistake that in theory you could speak this way, but because the people could be led into anthropomorphism, therefore it is no longer appropriate to speak this way. 
And so I, I don't know if fundamentally it's like an anti-traditionalist uh, position because you could make such an argument, uh, but uh, this, it clearly is not a traditional position. Uh, although Shadal himself says that this is what happens, that the Chazal, in order to ensure the purity of people's beliefs, change the vocalization from what originally it was because now you have examples of this uh, in my book, The Limits of Orthodox Theology, I discuss Tikkun Sofrim. We do have a concept of Tikkun Sofrim where, according to many versions, we have different texts that speak about Tikkun Sofrim, that is the Sofrim altered text. Now, in some of these, it doesn't mean it literally, it's just a euphemism. But in other texts, and I'm talking texts of the Midrash and the Aruch, classic texts. Uh, it's, it's stated that the Sofrim, that's, let's say, Ezra or uh, Anshik Nessus Gola, actually changed the, um, the text of the Torah, and they had the authority to do so. Now, I realize that Moshe Feinstein called this a heresy, and others have said that this, is, uh, this can't be true, and that uh, even Rav Zaya de Rossi, I'll talk about him on my trip to Italy, the Mori Naim, says that this is heresy and it can't be true. But the problem is we have this in multiple texts, and we don't just have it in multiple texts. We have it quoted in, in Rishoni. We have it quoted in Rashi. I'll show you in Rashi here, or at least in a version of Rashi, which uh, most people assume to be the correct version. Uh, in uh, uh, chapter 18, verse 22, it says, uh, Avraham remained standing before Hashem. And um, in this Pasuk, uh, Rashi says, it should have said, that Hashem is still is standing before, because Hashem came to Avraham. So what do you mean Avraham still standing? It should be Hashem still standing there. But it's a scribal emendation. And in the, the early versions we have, have what's in the brackets here. Asher which means that the, this, not the sages, the scribes, uh, they, they turned it around. And we have a number of other examples of Rashi where he quotes these texts. So he seems to have taken it um, literally. Uh, the, these words, Asher which are in all the Mikros Kodolos, uh, they were removed from the art scroll Mikros Kodolos, by the way. Uh, so if you want to know more about Tikkun Sofrim, as I said, it's a, uh, it, it doesn't, it's definitely in opposition to um, the Rambam's eighth principle. On the other hand, because you have here you have the later figures altering the Torah. On the other hand, we have a number of discussions where people explain why this is the case and that the Anshek Nessus Agdol and Ezra, Ezra is referred to, if it says that the Torah wasn't given through Moshe, it could have given to Ezra, that Ezra had the authority as like a, um, as, as a Shasad Chak sort of thing, a uh, Ace Lassos, that uh, it was important to remove this anthropomorphism. And, and it they tell us. It's not like they get rid of it and they pull the wool over our eyes. They tell us that this is a Tikkun Sofrim. So you know, sages, you know this is a Tikkun Sofrim, but the masses, when we read it to them, they'll see it one way. Uh, again, it's not in line with what uh, most people are taught today, but it's uh, it's found in authoritative sources. And Shaul Lieberman in Hellenism, Jewish Palestine, says that all attempts of uh, Zarya de Rossi and all the rest to try to... Uh, get rid of this other tradition to create one tradition are incorrect. There's actually two traditions. There's one tradition that Tikkun Sofrim means euphemism, that, not, that it, it's, it's uh, you should read the text as if it was uh, an emendation. And the other text though takes it literally. And uh, as I said, you can look at limits of Orthodox theology. I'm not here to uh, justify it or give the theology. I'm just saying it's there and uh, we have to deal with it. Uh, in fact, Ibn Ezra took it literally and Ibn Ezra rejects it. Ibn Ezra says uh, he rejects these midrashim that speak of a real tikkun sofrim because it says impossible. He says they're just wrong, but he acknowledges that this is what they, they thought. Uh, in any event, by pointing to these examples and things, including the things that uh, were regarded as tikkun sofrim, Geiger believes that he can show that um, what you have, if you look in the, the Bible, is an evolution. And um, there's a history of the text. And through the history of the text, you can see the history of the religion. And that's, uh, that's um, the major point he wants to show in this book. Uh, there's other things which we'll get to next class because uh, 
that said, how, what does reform mean? Where do you take reform? Is everything on the table? We'll get to that. And then Geiger's views of, is there a Jewish people then? I mean, all this sort of thing. But uh, this, this, this is an example of what we call engaged scholarship, showing how in the past something happened through scholarship, and then, then it should lead us to do it in the present. Now, from a traditionalist standpoint, uh, a, B doesn't follow from A, because I can acknowledge, let's say, that uh, I can, let's say I'll follow the, uh, the Aruch. The Aruch is an important source. When I go to Rome next week, I'm going to talk about the Aruch, because he comes from Italy. The Aruch takes Tikkun Sofrim literally. Now, what was the Aruch's theology? I don't know what his theology was. He obviously gave Ezra a certain role. It's not, he doesn't have to agree with the Rambam. <laughs> um, he is, uh, in fact, he's uh, Nathan. Uh, I just don't know offhand his uh, dates. So he's, ten, yeah, I see 1035 to 1106. So uh, he's a contemporary of the Rambam. So he doesn't have to follow the Rambam. I don't need to justify the Aruch. The Aruch is significant also for halachic reasons. The whole idea of psikoresha uh, dolanichale, that it's mutter, quoted by Tosfos. He's not just a dictionary, he's also a, a Rishon. Uh, and he took Tikkun Sofrim literally. So you can say, if you want to take Tikkun Sofrim literally, even though it's not like a mainstream view, fine, uh, the, 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 uh, Ezra could do this. Anche Ganesha Sagadolo could do it. That doesn't mean that uh, we could do it, uh, but uh, that's not Geiger's approach. Geiger, if Geiger's, he didn't have this sense of, um, of awe and uh, bitl das, I guess, to the, the sages. If the sages of the past could do it, well, I'm a sage also and I could do it as well. And uh, the, the thing about Geiger was, as we'll see, uh, with the, the, the problem with the destruction of the temple is that uh, everything was fossilized. He wants to bring back the way it was with the Pharisees when Judaism could move. And uh, his point, as I mentioned many times, is that we now are gonna be the real Pharisees. Uh, but it, it is interesting, and it's for another time a discussion to look at these examples um, that Geiger brings of let's say altering the readings. Uh, must we insist dogmatically that this is incorrect or uh, even from a purely traditional standpoint, leaving aside Shadal, can you argue that, uh, can you agree? I, I don't know, you have to ask the, the Orthodox theologians that yes, originally that was the reading and uh, Chazal had the authority to change the, the pronunciation precisely because of a fear of anthropomorphism. And maybe you can even say in Messianic days, we'll bring back the original reading. I can certainly see traditional sources um, having approach like that, because there's other, I don't know of those examples, but I know of similar sort of examples where they offer things like this. And uh, um, it would be interesting to develop if at least in some of these ideas, you can accept some of the arguments of Geiger without then accepting the conclusions. Because like I said, B doesn't follow from A. If Ezra or Chazal could change something, they, they create a Torah Shabbat path. So, I mean, <laughs> Are uh, you going to say because Chazal uh, made a takana or Chazal said we can't do this? Well, if the sages said that you can't do this on Shabbos, well, that shows that today we can say you can do it because we're sages like they're sages. That would just, well, that's exactly what Geiger's going to do. That would mean that the whole oral law, that would mean that the whole, our whole um, religion, much of which is based on the rabbis, has now been overthrown because, well, if the rabbis did it, then we can do it. And uh, for traditional Judaism, obviously the two don't follow. The rabbis had the authority to do certain things. Uh, but we'll leave that, I think. Let me take the questions and comments. Uh, one thing you can't deny, no one can deny it, is that uh, Geiger is a chacham. <laughs> He's, uh, and, uh, his greatest opponents had to acknowledge that uh, he, some of his things were just, uh, people just hadn't thought of it before. Ah, so someone, uh, thank you, pointed out that 1516 was the year the Jews were confined to the ghetto, which I had forgotten. So uh, so we're over uh, 500. Um, uh, so uh, someone disagrees that they're anything but do-gooders. Ah, no, he agrees with me, anything but do-gooders, yeah. You know, this is, at other times it's more controversial. Those of you who've been to Europe, and you'll see it in Italy with me next week, uh, if you're with me, um, the Schulperstein's on the ground. Um, you find them all over, and I like them very much. I think they're a great way of memorializing. But in Munich, the, the leader of the Munich community, or one of the leaders, uh, is staunchly opposed. Uh, she's a survivor, and uh, she thinks it's disrespectful to uh, walk on the names. So uh, I, um, 
although I think it's uh, it's a mistake and it's a great way of commemorating, but uh, I, you see that, but with regard to the old images in a church, uh, today they are only historical images. And, uh, uh, you know, I, it's, it's interesting because I, I, I don't know how consistent I am because it didn't bother me when I took the Confederate statues down, even though I'm a historian, maybe because I'm not an American historian. I know my father, when he drove up, I think it was in Richmond, uh, you know, historically, it's interesting to see them. On the other hand, um, you could say perhaps that the Confederate statues are not just uh, antiquarian interests. <laughs> People actually uh, today are uh, motivated by them. You have Confederate flags uh, on cars, uh, as well as the fact that, uh, let's be realistic here, the Confederate generals and all these Confederate, it's not, they were traitors to the country. It's very unusual to have statues in a country of traitors, uh, leaving aside the whole racial angle here. Uh, so uh, that's something else. But uh, I, I, I will be very disappointed if uh, they remove, as MH Lays said, they're not good, good do-gooders. If they remove that, uh, these things, it would make my trips less interesting. Susanna asked, what are the girls? Now, I didn't take any pictures of the girls in Gerba because, first of all, it's Friday. The girls don't have school on Friday. Uh, they, um, I guess they're taught to help out at home. But the girls go to a different type of school. It's called Confe Yona. You can uh, just Google it or email me. I'll send you the link. The Wall Street Journal even had a whole video on this about uh, 2016, so six years ago. They're, they're taught languages, English and French, and uh, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a culture gap because they're secularly educated and they're taught Hebrew. Everyone's taught Hebrew, by the way. Everyone speaks Hebrew, but they're taught Hebrew even more, the girls. So they're no, given a they're whole education. Kodesh? No, they they Kodesh. Kodesh. no, of course, Limude Kodesh, but also a, a, a full Limude Chol curriculum funded by the joint um, to a certain extent. Uh, iPad says, for me, the question is, do we use public money to maintain these items? Uh, some universities have publicly funded now, have crosses built into them. Should public money be used to maintain these images or as they decay, should they be removed? I, I think uh, from my standpoint would be if it's if it's like an old university and it has a, a cross in it and now it's being publicly run, that's no longer religious. That's, that's part of the, uh, the historical element of it. Uh, so I would say you definitely uh, keep them up. Um, by the way, it also bothered me um, when I was at Harvard, there was, uh, you had uh, pictures, for example, I think it was a uh, Pusey, the, I forget, I think he might have been the president or Lamont, I forget which one, it was, I forget his name, Lamont, uh, the one who um, is famous for keeping Jews out, uh, you know, too many Jews. Uh, and um, so there were pictures of him in one of the, um, yeah, the Lamont, I think it was maybe Lamont, there's a library named after him. And I remember thinking that, you know what, it doesn't bother me anymore. You know, Jews are now at Harvard. If you want to have his picture up there, uh, that to me doesn't bother me. It's, uh, Look, we've got to the point where Teddy Roosevelt's statue's down in New York, and uh, they want to take Abraham Lincoln. I, so I don't like it all. Um, uh, so I want to ask privately, is there, because the political pressure from the Arabs and the government about Jerba, um, I'm not sure what the question exactly was, so you can ask it again. Um, um, okay. Okay. Um, iPad says orthodoxy has survived, even thrived, but has also changed. Well, yes, in our little communities, it has. But if you look at the broader picture, and if I tell you that less than 15% of the American Jewish community is Shomer Shabbos, is that really thriving? When you're living in Teaneck, or when you're living in our communities, it looks very thriving, and it is. But on the other hand, if you go out to the heartland, you go where most Jews are, it's not thriving. Now, we'll continue to thrive. And soon <laughs> there won't be many of them left, unfortunately. It is unfortunately, but that's the reality because America is a place where if you're not connected, you, you easily intermarry. But um, I could see Geiger coming back and saying uh, 15%, you think that's uh, thriving? Thriving is 50%, 80% or something. It's not... Uh, um... Yeah, so that says 19th century worse. There weren't many Jews living in 18th century worse. 18th century Vilna, I should say. 18th century Vilna was mostly uh, Jewish. The majority of Vilna in the 18th century was Jewish. 
Uh, M.H. Lazenson, um, many conservative and reform institutions have posted signs outside saying abortion is a Jewish value. Yeah, I have to tell you, I'm very troubled by this because even though I myself basically think pro-choice is the better movement for our community, uh, at the end of the day, uh, this does mean that all sorts of abortions are going to happen, which are not in accord with our values and halacha. And it's a strategic thing, I think, that, uh, that uh, you know, I don't want government being involved in this, but to turn it into a value, a Jewish value, it's, it's not a Jewish value. And uh, it, it's a pagan idea that uh, you, know, you can be pro-choice without saying a woman's body, her choice and all that, because these are pagan ideas. We don't believe it's our body. We don't believe you can have a tattoo. So... Uh, and it's unfortunate that I think the conservative reform movement, instead of just using it, well, reform, they're not, they don't, you know, they're not really part of any halakhic system, but the conservative movement, which they, they so easily fell into this trap of using the progressive language when you could have this, in other words, you could march and have a sign saying pro-choice. And you could be 100% pro-choice, but it doesn't mean you need to march and have a sign saying our body, our lives or anything, making the essentially pagan argument that, uh, which always uh, I find astounding because a lot of these women who are marching, making that point, as soon as they marry and are pregnant, then they put on the refrigerator, the ultrasound. And they're so excited when they heard the heartbeat. But wait a second, I, I thought that it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't a life. We all know it's alive. Now, lots of things are alive. A dog's alive also, but we can kill a dog. So you can, there are times when you can kill it, even if it is alive. But to, 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 to make believe like it's not living, of course it's living. It's, uh, so I am very disappointed in the conservative movement in particular because Robert Gordas has a whole article on this talking about the, the pagan, my, my language here, the pagan idea comes rightly out of an article by Robert Gordas in Midstream Magazine in which he spoke about uh, this rhetoric and how it's, uh, we as Jews need to oppose it. And now his very movement uh, has now adopted the very rhetoric that helps explain perhaps why Gordas's grandson, uh, um, uh, Daniel Gordas, writes an article a few years ago in Jewish Books, a requiem for the conservative movement, because basically everything conservative Judaism used to be has been forgotten. And, uh, uh, and many other conservative thinkers from the old school who made that point. And again, you could be 100% pro-choice. Even uh, Ashram Patton told me that Rivar and Solveitchik was pro-choice because he said they're going to get abortions anyway. And what do we, you know, it's just going to make it worse. And, uh, and you have plenty of uh, Rabani who think that it's not our job to get involved. That this is not a Jewish issue. Let, let the American government deal with this. Uh, we want to have options for halakhic abortions. And you know, if Roe versus Wade is overturned in many states, you're not going to be able to get a halakhically approved abortion. So uh, now you might say, well, maybe that's a sacrifice we should give up and, so that all the other abortions, a million abortions a year don't happen. But, but who says, you know, it's the land of the free and the home of the brave here, religious freedom. Uh, why should we get up for religious freedom? So there's arguments. It's an interesting debate. You can have the debate. Uh, but I, I wish conservative had gone a different route. iPad says that... Um, B. Barry Levy says that in the Middle Ages, so for men her text to conform to the Zohar... Uh, it's, I wouldn't say amended the Torah text, the Zohar, um, and I don't remember the exact answer, your, your, your exact example you're giving, but we have different reading traditions. The Zohar preserves certain texts read in a certain way that our texts don't have, but Rashi has certain texts that our texts don't have. We know that Sofrim at various times were like a guild that is according to Halakha. This is the Halakha by all the poskim. If uh, you have a, a verse quoted in the Talmud and it's used for halachic reason, that is, they give a drash on it, and it's based upon the way it's spelled, then that's how it has to appear in our Torah texts. And yet our Torah texts do not have that. Our Torah texts do not follow that halacha because the Sofrim were never led by the rabbis. The Sofrim had their own traditions, and that's why in every single Torah text we have now, it's in opposition to the halacha as it appears in all the halachic texts. That is, they did not go in accordance with um, follow that if it's a drasha and halacha. Uh, they, they followed their own way. And this is now our Masoretic text. Uh, um, by the way, our text is not Rashi's text. There's a famous example in, uh, in Breshis where Rashi said, 
asks why there's this vav here and gives a drasha on it. And our text does not have the vav on that. And uh, so there's a, a lot of discussion you can read in, in B. Barry Levy's book, uh, uh, Fixing God's Torah, and he uses the word fixing because of tikkun. That's what tikkun sofrim is. Uh, uh, this whole idea of uh, how the Torah text we have. I'll just mention something which is of interest because a lot of people get it wrong completely. A lot of people speak about the authenticity of our Torah because you can go everywhere in the world and uh, there's like hardly any divergences. There's like seven, cha nine changes, I think, and only two of them are uh, deal with words, vayubene noach, yivayubene noach, and, um, and also dakaz and aleph or a hey. Uh, and that's between the Yemenites and us. And they say that uh, everywhere you go, the Torah text is the exact same, and that shows you uh, the greatness of our tradition, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, the actual point is incorrect. I guarantee you, almost every Torah you pick up, you will find changes in it. How do I know this? Because the people who do computers, they claim that every Torah they put under a computer, even Torahs that have been read for a hundred years, they found mistakes in them. Uh, so uh, our Torah texts are full of mistakes, number one. Number two, even in terms of an actual version that uh, we know what we want it to be, this was only possible with the rise of printing. Before you had printing and then you had a one, Textus Receptus, like one authoritative text, text Kubal, you had lots of different texts. In medieval Ashkenaz, for instance, you had lots of different texts. The, the, the differences are minuscule, tiny, but they're differences. And an extra vav here, an extra vav there, that, uh, that according to Halakha, apostles, the Torah. The question is, well, which is the one? Um, well, the Avad, it wouldn't possible it because we're not uh, Bucky on um, Mali and Chaser, according to almost everyone, it wouldn't possible it. But we have other ones as well, other changes in, in the text. Uh, it's only with the rise of printing. We have Masoretic works, beginning in particular with uh, Rameir Halevi's work, Masora Siagwa Torah. He tells us that uh, there are so many different versions, we have to have a correct one, and then you have the Mincha Shai and you have Menachem Monzano's work, and finally there was a printing, and it was the Mikros Kodolos, and that then became the text which all Sofrim began to, began to copy from. But before you had that, there was all sorts of different traditions with small differences, and this isn't speculation. We have Sifrei Torah from these periods, and we can see that, but it's to be expected because um, mistakes, eventually over time then become a quote tradition. So by the, you needed the Mincha Shai and you needed from Nachem Onzano to look at the best manuscripts and put together what they thought was the best text. And I tell you now, it's not even the best text. The Yemenites have the better text because the Yemenite text is in line with the Aleppo Codex. And Rameir Halevi Abulafia, the Ramah, he says that he doesn't have the Ramam's text. He didn't call it the Aleppo Codex, but the Rambam refers to this text. And because he doesn't have this text, he tells us in the introduction that he's going to take the best Ashkenazic and the best, no, no, I said the best, I think he says the best Sephardic texts. So he's going to take the best Sephardic texts. And out of that, he's going to come up with the best one. And then you continue down the road. That's what they were doing. And they came up with a text. And the Aleppo Codex is not the identical. We, although we're missing on Torah, the Aleppo Codex, we have testaments to what was in there. But um, basically, we can say what the text should be. But throughout history, many people did not have that uh, because different traditions developed. And the fact remains that uh, in the Talmud, we have different versions of the text. So that's just the way it is. But that's, uh, this is how Ach matter like anything else. Nissen says, the last mission attracted Arach and mandates abortion in the ninth month. Well. <laughs> It's it's uh, it's uh, the Mishnah and Sanhedrin, um, and uh, it's an, it's not a rock, and it's an Oolos. Where uh, no, no, no no no, I'm speaking of the case of Inu Hadin about the Isha Hayose Slehore who oh, has right. gone okay, yes. to labor. Yes, so that's, not yet gone to labor. Yes, and that's uh, that's another proof that it's not human life because if they say if it's human life, I think you're referring to Oolos, uh, where she's actually that's, that's something else. That's yes. the classical. So, uh, in fact, Rav Yaakov Emden, um, he, he claimed that, uh, um, therefore, a woman who committed adultery and got pregnant uh, because we would execute her, we had a base of just therefore you can uh, do the abortion. Now, 
Yes. So Within can... Namyo, Rabbi Black taught me that in one of his earlier works from decades ago. Yes. But, it's, but there it's Namyo. It's interesting why he doesn't seem to extend it. Uh, what'd you say? It's, what did he say? That, that's Toch Namyo when he says it's Mayo Bi Alma. The only, it's, the only um, uh, Avera would be Hashchasas Zera. Um, oh, you're saying Yaakov Emden. Yaakov Emden, right. Okay. Yaakov Emden. By the, the way, yeah. yeah, the fact that it's not clear if there's any prohibition uh, other than Ashkasa or other things, Toch Mem Yom, and we know that we have all sorts of lenient uh, positions. Ravad Yosef would permit in all sorts of uh, uh, reasons. But uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for reminding me of uh, that. But Rav Shechter is not, was talking about a case where it was a, a Tzorech Gadol not a mandate abortion. And he said, even in the ninth month. Uh, uh, Mark says, isn't Bereshit also a construct? Yeah, but how would you spell it? That, that, that's the word. So uh, with Bamidbar and with Shemot, you, can, you would actually spell it differently. Uh, so it's, uh, you don't have the issue with Bereshit. Uh, Ipet says, we don't formally mourn a child who dies within 30 days. That is true, but we don't say, we, we still regard it as uh, a human life. You can't kill it or anything like that. Uh, it's uh, we don't give it mourning, but uh, you can't uh, you can't kill it. Uh, uh, so Lazer and said, the Russians have removed the statue of Stalin and Lenin. That's different because uh, it, it's so much closer to the time, and those those statues meant oppression and uh, control for of people lived under this. Uh, we're not talking about um, like if a statue 500 years ago, that's like saying taking a, czar, a statue from the czar from uh, 400 years ago and removing it. That's, uh, you know, if they were to find in 500 years from now, if they find a statue underneath some uh, snow of Stalin, then it would be, uh, you know, something. And by the way, it's still dangerous. They were marching in London yesterday. These leftists, they were saying, uh, they were saying Castro, Che Guevara, Stalin. So that people want to bring him back. Uh, Lowell. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's Lowell. That, that was the, um, the president uh, of Harvard. Uh, and the Jewish demography of Jer in Jerba, it's uh, 1,200 Jews, all Shomer Shabbos. Uh, lots of children. Uh, oh, the question was about political pressure from the government that the Jerba community is opposed to Zionism and making Aliyah. Absolutely not. Don't go there yourself. You'll see. You sit around the Shabbos table, I would ask everyone, why not go to Israel? And they, the same answer from everyone. We saw what happened when they went to Israel. And the rabbis wrote back saying, don't come. And it's like Yosef was there a few years ago. He told them, don't go to Israel. These are typical Sephardic, you know, uh, you know they wear jeans, you know, T-shirts, right? But the only cultures in the island are the Arab culture and the Jewish culture. And the Jewish culture is Shomer Shabbos and religious. So by definition, they're in a religious community. They go to Israel, immediately then there'd be another Jewish culture and half of them would drop out. And uh, they saw that happen because then after this 1948, many Jews from Jerba went to Israel and they became a Sorati or completely irreligious. There's one named, he went to, or he was, went in the seventies. His name is Raphram Chadad. You can look him up. He's a world renowned artist. And uh, I mean, the, the idea that a Jew from Jerba would not be religious, it's unheard of. And yet, uh, Menachem Mazuz, you heard of Menachem Mazuz, wasn't he attorney general in Israel? Uh, this comes from the most Yichustic family, if I can use the word Yichustic to refer to a Sephardic family, the most Yichustic family in all of Tunisia, Rav Mazuz. If you've been with me for so long, that's Rav Mazuz's first cousin. He comes from uh, the Rabbanim Gedoli Gedoli Yisrael. This never, ever happened, just like it never happened in Yemen. I mean, how many you have Yemenite murders you've had in Israel now? Uh, I heard with my own ears, I heard Menachem Meir Kahana say, and he was a big Zionist, you can't deny this. He said, in 2000 years in Yemen, you never had one Jewish murderer and now we have, in Yemen, and now we have all of them because of what, and his point was, of what the secularists did to them. But I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing that they, the community, they send their kids on birthright. There's a special birthright from the kids of Jerba. It's the only birthright in the world that's in Hebrew because they all know Hebrew and it's run, and they run it in a very special way. Obviously, boys separate, girls separate. But nevertheless, there is a lot of fear. And all the people I spoke to, the kids stay in the community and the community is expanding. They keep expanding the air of, and uh, they don't want their kids to go to Israel because they're afraid they won't remain religious. And uh, so my son who was with me, he's starting Moshevah next week as a counselor again. 
I said, go there and speak to the people of Mosheva. You know, the Mosheva types, they're all B'nai Akiva. The idea is if you're not living in Israel, you know, you're half a Jew and everyone should be in Israel. So I, he's going to ask them, what about, here's the, here's the reality. If these young people go to Israel, guaranteed at least half of them will become not uh, halachic, completely halachic. Should they still come to Israel? Let's see uh, what they tell the Mosheva. Uh, Ellen says, we'll go for five more minutes. Ellen says, in the intro to the Haketer, uh, Uriel Menachem uh, notes, no, no, his name is not Uriel Menachem. Um, I forget his name, um, the, the editor of it. Check the name again. It's not, um, I, his name is escaping you now, but it's it's not Uriel Menachem. Uh, uh, notes that other editions edits Rashi's Dibur Machil to conform to our text, but he doesn't. Okay, the Dibur Machil is a different issue. Uh, um, oh, and that's the last um, um, point. Let me just say one more thing before we end. Uh, because I said um, that it's not, um, I want to give you the name of uh, him, Menachem, ha- Menachem HaKohen, that's, that's who it is, uh, okay. not Uriel Menachem, Menachem HaKohen. Okay, but thank you just, all. That's just how we know, one of the ways we know that Rashi had a different text is from the manuscripts, you know that, and then everybody has managed to wipe it out. Oh, I see what you're saying, yes, so I, I misunderstood what you were saying, yes, absolutely, sometimes, uh, exactly, that, that's the example I, I well, the example I gave you explains it in a note, but you're right. Absolutely. That's uh, the Dibor Amachil um, could tell us that. But again, these, these differences are minuscule. Uh, an extra Vav, maybe an extra Yud. This is what the Gemara speaks about when it says that um, we're not, you can't count it. They asked, they said, bring out the Torah, we can count it. So we know what's the middle. We're not Bucky and Malay and Chaser. But uh, the thing is that the Gemara often has drushes, Dafka on these Vavs. So um, the question is then, if you learn a halacha on it, according to the Radbaz and all the halachic sources, our Sefer Torah should reflect the drasha, but it doesn't. So why doesn't it? Well, if you want to read this, read Schneer Lyman's article. I think it's called, you can get it on the Lyman Library, Halacha and History, something like that. It's a whole article as to why Halacha did not win out over the Sofrim. And on this, it's, and it's everything Schneider Lyman writes. It's a, it's a beautiful read. So um, I encourage you all to uh, check it out. And thank you for spending the night with me tonight. I hope my voice wasn't so bad. It's helping me get out of COVID, uh, learning Torah and talking to all of you. And thank you for your comments. Uh, Dr. Mark, is Menachem HaKohen the, the Haver Knesset from Ovid Hadati? No, 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 no. He's a, Menachem HaKohen is a biblical scholar. Menachem HaKohen, the Haver Knesset, who's got to be, how old is he now? <laughs> he was the man that, that Menachem Begin called oh, Rav Matam. <laughs> yes, Menachem HaKohen was a member of for many, okay. he's born in 1932, so he's 89, I just checked it. He's the father of Aviad HaKohen, as a uh, the dean of one of the law schools and a scholar. He was always the rabbi for the, he was the late in the labor movement, but he's also the brother of Pinchas Peli and also uh, Shmuel Avidor. So they're, uh, they're of uh, good, um, good families and, uh, but it's completely different uh, people. And uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Mark, after you left our class, the Mark, he uh, did an interview in our my class and chat today. So the kids want, it's the second last day of the year. They want to discuss biblical criticism a little bit, you know, because I once mentioned class, we never discussed it. Anyways, but I pointed out we, among the things we discussed is, of course, the, the Rabbi Akiva Eger on Shabbos Nun Hayam and Beit, where Rabbi Akiva Eger lists off about 25 places where our Sefer Torah is different from the Sefer Torah and the Gemara. Like you were saying, all the Trush, Sukkot, Sukkot, Sukkot. Yeah. Various threshold and Rabbi Key Vager just collects them. Says, yeah. Or it says but this, our Torah is the best. Chaim Hershenson has a chew on biblical criticism, and he says, and people forget this, you have to distinguish between lower criticism and higher right. criticism. Okay, lower criticism yep. is trid- so free, make mistakes. There's different versions. That, he says, is Limud Torah. Higher criticism, that's the theological issue, the problem, different documents. And that's where you get to Yehuda Chassid. And if right. there's, if that, you know, with, uh, to, and even, and Bill criticism today is, is it's much more than documents because that already maybe you can argue Huda Chassid. They're talking in terms of that the author of Deuteronomy had a different theological conception in Exodus, and it contradicts it. That so that's something totally different. But Rabbi Chaim Hershenson says explicitly, like Rabbi Kiva Eger, that uh, this is Limud Torah. Now for Halacha, we can only write a Sefer Torah one way, but he says that if you want to suggest, like we saw the Vilna Gaon, you know, like does with the uh, explanations. 
that this is what the text should say, that's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with suggesting that maybe the original text was this, but halacha lamaisa, we have to write it this way. I'm not saying you should go into your local yeshiva and start suggesting it, but that's what he says. And that's what uh, you have, uh, I, I gave in the limits of Orthodox theology, an example where the Orachayim, he mentions, uh, you have an ex- whatever, they, 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 it's for a discussion for a different time, but uh, Rishmul Ashkenazi, that great uh, bibliophile who passed away, he gave an example where um, all the ancient texts, the, 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 the Arachayim asks a question, why the text of the Torah reads a certain way, and he gives a, dr- a, a drush type of answer. And Shmuel Ashkenazi says, the different version is found in the Targumim, it's found in, um, in all the translations, and he says that really, it could be that what we have in our Masoretic text is not the authentic version, but that's whatever, that's the version we have. Uh, and uh, this is published in one of the rabbinic journals in Israel. Next week, I'll show it to you, actually. Uh, so people will find it interesting. Yeah. Okay, it's late. We we'll wish you a very good night. Tomorrow, Dr. Dr. Tova Genzel is beginning her seven-part series. I invite everybody to that. 12 noon on uh from the end of the kingdom of Yehuda to the beginning of uh, the return to Zion, sort of the later books in Tanakh, tomorrow at noon. And then at 1.30, Lori Nova continues on learning Talmud with Levinus. So that's tomorrow, 12 and 1.30, kind of almost back to back. And then uh, Thursday, Shuli Mishkin, as I sent that before, will be giving class. She announced last week she couldn't, but she will be giving the class um, today, at, you know, Thursday at 12. That is after Daniel Laster's class on charism, finishing of series on charism. So look forward to learning with you. Then the Parsha Thursday night, Aaron Greenberg, my share in the Sitter Friday. And we look forward to learning Marty Lection Wednesday morning. So uh, look forward to learning with you. Invite a friend and everybody have a Lila Tov and good night. And thank you very much. And be well. Thank you, Eric Lila Tov.